Um, so there's a couple of ways to access this, alright? So you can download straight from iTunes U, which hopefully most of you have done. It's in iTunes U. Uh, the reason it's there, I'll explain shortly, uh, just so you can do some note-taking over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, for those that don't have net access, I will give you the direct link to download it from the campus, okay? So, essentially what you've got in here, if you go into my info, alright, we've got a rundown of what this course is about, which I'm sure you all read, clearly. Alright, yes? Yeah, um, we've got in the over in the outline here, okay, it's it's pretty it's pretty short. So we've got your actual project, we've got your success rubric, and we've got some copyrights in here. Okay, so I'm a big one for doing oh, click, 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 click. Okay, we'll start with that. Alright, so this is all the references that I've used uh, in putting this book together. Okay, now clearly um, I've used other people's uh, information on people's work and I've put that together for you uh, to help you out, which we'll look in a second. And I've also got a few other copyright infos down there. So if you head to the copyright page, uh, you will find everything that I've used and where I've used it. Okay, so you can actually find that a bit more in depth about that information. It's also within the book itself. So that's really important for me as well that we've got that there. Okay, the success rubric we'll talk about in a second as well. Now, what you'll notice, if anyone's seen that sucker, is I put this together so it's very, very, very detailed. Okay? It's not one, two, three, four, five. It's very, very detailed. So that's why I'm doing this little lesson now, because I want to talk about this. Okay, I want to talk about the project, and I want to talk about what's required. And the reason why, okay, is you won't be doing this in class. We'll have this lesson, okay, but other than that, you're doing this at home. Okay? In that email I sent you, I gave you some due dates and I gave you, these, I gave you four due dates. Okay? The big due date is the actual project's due on the 22nd of November. Okay? That's a long time. That's a month. Uh, what, a month and a week almost? It's a long time away. Okay? So, it's a long time away. You won't be doing it in class, so you'll have a lot of responsibility. All right? Which is why I want to be really, really clear in everything that I present to you. So, when it comes time to hand these things in, you won't be going, oh, I didn't, I didn't know I could do that, I didn't know I could do this. So it's going to be really, really quick. Okay? Uh, another thing that I have on there is milestones. Did anyone read that one? Okay, so what the milestones are is the project is going to be basically three parts. Okay? And these milestones, what you'll do is, the first ones are, are a couple of weeks from now, is you'll basically show me, you'll come to class that day, and you'll have a part of this project completed, and I'll tick it off and say, yep, yeah, excellent. That part's done. You'll come back in another couple of weeks. Ah, oh, this part of the project's completed. I'll tick it off. And then the third milestone, this part of the project's completed. So basically what I'm doing is, it's like three separate mini due dates. Okay? And again, this is so I can help you kind of stay on task. Alright? So if you're having trouble, you know, I can help you and we can make sure you hit each one of those dates. Because I think it's a big responsibility to give you, you know, a lot of work. And just say, here you go, here's a project, come back to me in a week. Uh, and it's done. I think that's, that's a pretty big responsibility. So I'm going to help you out. So, alright. We'll jump into this one here. So, basically the first thing you guys want to do is download that book. Okay, and we'll get going. So I'm just going to switch across to my Mac and I will run through the book on there because it's just a little bit easier for me. So, you have five seconds to look important while I do that. Now, can you give me a theme song while I'm changing? Keep going. That's the boring preaching part. Let's get into the project. So, I'm cool. Are you going to go with it? Yes, I'm good. Okay, so what you find I'm doing in this project, every chapter, okay, I will have the Japanese uh, basically uh, spelling, I guess you could use, and their, their alphabet. I will then have the English kind of translation for that, okay, uh, and then we'll, I'll have the actual English for it. So, introduction. Do you, do you, want to, you probably know this. Do you want to explain, explain the difference between one, two, and three? Uh, As in, Japanese people don't use that, do they? Oh, I don't know. No. Can you explain it? No. No, okay. Does that, can anyone explain? Okay, so obviously in Japan, uh, they use their alphabet, which is called... Come on, Dan, you can get this one for me. What's the Japanese? Does anyone know what the Japanese? Japanese. Come on, can anyone do it for me? So the kanji, right? There we go. Alright, so that's their spelling of this word. Okay, now this here is 
what I would say is say the English interpretation of that word. So in Japan, they don't write that. Okay, they write this. Okay, yeah, but yes, but that's how we would write if we were using English characters. That's how we would write that term. Okay, so that's just something to because you've never done Japanese before. I have. Um, a lot of you. Has anyone done Japanese as a, as a class? Yes, I did. Oh, primary school? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I did I did Japanese for a long time, um, and I lived there as well. So this is this is a lot of schools do Japanese. Uh, my wife's school teaches Japanese, so it will give you a little. This this course, this uh, book's giving you a little bit of some uh, Japanese, you know, teaching. So yeah, so that's how they. And by that, of course, I mean Japanese will we'll spell this word, okay? And that's how we, using English characters, will spell this word, okay? Uh, and they both mean the same thing. In this case, it means introduction. Right. So, let me start. So, the Japanese art, this project is called the Japanese Art History Project. That's what I've called it. Uh, or I've also called it this one up here, okay? Which is Jijisu, which is, it just means art. It just means art. Just it, it makes me sound important. So. Japanese art comes with a wide range of art styles, media, uh, including pottery, sculpture, ink painting, calligraphy, um, and we've got woodblock prints as well, which we call uh, called Yukio E, and we've got all of these kirigami, origami, dance, theatre, uh, we talked about manga, video games. So their, their art covers a wide range of different styles. Okay? So Japanese art has a really, really long history as well, and it ranges from pretty much the beginnings of what I've got here is human habitation in Japan. So basically, since there have been people in Japan, they've been doing art, which is like most cultures, you know. We've got art in Australia dating back to the first time, I guess, uh, our native people were walking around the place. They were doing art as well. So it's got a really, really long history, all right? Pretty much from sometime in the 10th millennium BC uh, to the present day. So this project, all right, in this project, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be choosing to focus on one kind of aspect of Japanese art, and you're going to choose this yourself, all right? And you're going to do it to tell a story, all right? You're going to tell a story of life in Japan, and it's in, in the, the period of Japan that we're going to be studying over the next month as well, okay? So, let's find out what we're going to be doing. Oh, by the way, that's Daniel, um, which I thought was cool. So, let's move across. Also, you'll see that this book is very uh, visual, okay? A lot of artworks in here. So, take the time to see the artwork. You know, who did it, what it's about, and the date as well. So some really, really cool art in here as well. So here we go. This is your present. So chapter two. So in this chapter, we're going to look at some of the many art forms. So I'm just going to show you a quick example of, I think I've done about four or five different art forms in Japan. Okay. Uh, this will range from like really ancient traditional stuff into some more contemporary stuff. Uh, there'll also be a collection of videos, you know, examples, and some interactivity stuff in here as well, which you can kind of have a play with. All right, so the whole point of this chapter is just to give you a little bit of background into some, some forms of Japanese art. Okay? These aren't necessarily the ones that you need to do for your project when I talk about it at the end, but they're just there to give you uh, an idea of what's out there. That's all it is. Okay? So, it's just a really, really small example. So when you go back and you start to research what you're going to do for your project, you're going to find that small. You're going to find one that interests you, hopefully. That's the whole point of doing this. All right? So, this, I mean, everyone would have seen this image here. The great way? With the bunnies. Yeah, it's really, I mean, this is probably one of the most popular pieces of the Japanese art, I think. In terms of Western eyes, like, I think even us, uh, it, it, us dumb kind of, you know, country folk, if we see that, we will go, oh, wait, that's a Jap really famous Japanese art. Yeah. Um, so this is a wood block, this is what's called a wood cut or a wood block print. So this kind of artwork is essentially like, you know, if you guys see a really cool poster that you like, and you go and buy it. That's what this is, okay, but a long time ago. What they used to do in Japan with these is they used to make these prints. And then people would buy these and they'd put them on their wall, okay? Because they used to do this thing called wood rock. We'll have a look in a second. So that's what that is. Really, really famous print. So it's a, basically, it's a really famous poster. All right, Bo? How did you get famous? Um, I guess in terms of, this is a series of artworks. Uh, I think you did about 30 odd of these, all in these different views of Mount Fuji. And I don't know, it just, it just did over the time, it just got, I mean, it looks cool for one, the colours are really nice, it just got famous. I mean, is it like saying, I guess, why is the Mona Lisa famous? Yeah, I guess, oh, there you go, it's perspective. Um, Alright, so, let's move on. So the first one we're going to look at, now I'm not going to go through all of these details in here, okay, because that's why you've got the book, you can check it out at any time. 
All right. But the first one is this one here, which is uh, who wants to be my word of the day and try to pronounce these? Do it. Yukio. And Yukio. Thank you. Oh, fans got it. All right. And so that literally means. Okay. So that literally means pictures of a floating world. That's what that term means. So essentially, what this is is it's a it's a woodblock print. Okay. So what it is is they make. They make these, these are posters, like I said, this is the easy way to put it. These are posters which are made from these wood blocks that they print together. I'll show you how they do it in a second. Um, and they were really, really, really uh, popular in Japan, okay? So they use them in books, they use them in, uh, in artworks, the posters, like I said, and they were, because they were cheap, you know, they were cheap to get around, to, to, to give to everybody. So, you know, in Japan back then, people weren't, um, you know, there were a lot of people that weren't super rich, but they really like the nice piece of art. Okay, so this is where this kind of woodblock print stuff is really good because they could afford to, to actually own this stuff. All right, so it's a really, really old kind of style of art. Um, and I've got here as well, it came from the early Edo period. Now you're going to be seeing this a lot, these kind of words. All right, I'll just, I can probably define that from here. Look at that. All right, so these are words that they use for periods of time. All right, so remember in medieval Europe we were studying, we've got like medieval and we've got the Renaissance and we've got all those kind of words as well. All right, so these are going to be words that you're going to see which I'll explain a little bit later, which talks about certain parts, certain parts of time, okay, and they, get, they call them periods and they gave them all these different names. So we'll have a look at that. So I'm not going to read through all of this, you can check it out later. All right, so I'll just move across here and show you some examples. So these are some examples of some woodblock prints. You'll see a lot of this if you guys are really into your art at the National Gallery of Victoria. They have a lot of this stuff. Okay. Um, so what you're seeing here is these are parts of their theatre. Okay. So these are like you know movie posters, pretty much. All right, just a couple hundred years old. Um, and we've got things going on here with their history. These are actors in their in their theatre. Okay. So this is kind of like that's like One Direction. You know, like these are this is a, a famous actor. You know, in one of their uh, in one of their plays, okay, and that's what they used to do this for. They had these big plays, and it's like, oh, cool, make some posters for our famous actors, and we'll give them to the crowds. And they did all of that just a long time ago. All right, so here's a few examples there, which you can check out later. And here's the process, okay. So it's not just a simple. Here's a bit of wood, put it in some ink, splat. We now have a poster. It used. They had to do many, many, many different levels of this because these were color. These were in full color. Okay, so what they had to do was they had to make lots of different levels and they used to, one print would involve about 20 or 30 different stamps essentially to make it. So, I'll show you really quick how they did that. So this is one print. So you can see every step they need to actually make this print. So what they're doing, what they're doing is they're starting on a blank bit of paper, they're getting one, one uh, wood block and they're going splat with ink and they're putting it on the paper. Then they're getting another one on the same paper and putting it on there. Getting another one and putting it on there. It's like, it's like screen printing, okay? Because they can't get their entire picture with all those colours with one stamp. So they've got like 30 or 40 different stamps that they're stamping on the one bit of paper to make this, okay? Because that kind of makes it does take a long time. No, it's really cool. Um, you wouldn't want to stop it. So you can see here, yeah, that's just that stamp, just that colour. That's just that stamp, just that colour. It's going into you know, even just that, just the shape. So I'll rewind it. So it's going back again. So that is there, that is there, that is there. This is the how it is. That just does that colour. Well, they have an outline, and then there's an empty. Right. So they were really. Um, so a really, really popular art form, and I think it's one of probably the more popular that we'll see um, walking around the place. So that's it there. Uh, these two videos here from the NGV will actually kind of show you how they make this. Okay, so this was done in Melbourne. Press the button. Yeah. Pocket. 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 Yeah. You print with that. There's a print there. And unlike a printing press, what's nice about this is you can put it in your back pocket and you can take it anywhere. So if you're not restricted. Yeah, this is. Ah, no. Ah, no. Mugen Dai no Okusama de Sureru. 
And also, you can actually print really big sizes with this. まあこれも検討と同じで一つの優れた発明だと思う。This is also something that he feels personally, like the registration marks. This is another great invention. The barons are traditionally. Can you check it out later. But this goes into detail how they actually make this form of art. Okay, so maybe this might be Up one two. Paints were imported from the west. So they use natural. He's using natural materials, like using leaves and grasses. And that's what so. Um, the colour that we made, really, made the images that we see as if you were now is probably a lot of ink being used in that's actually from the West. So when you first apply ink, you'll notice the, the condition of the plate itself is less stable. So you'll find that you have to actually apply it several times before you get the effect that you want. It's his intention to really just put a very, very fine layer of subtle colour down. Although it would seem simple, trying to print flat color is actually quite difficult. Try and use as much pressure as possible. Therefore, you see, like he's using his whole body. Also, there's a direct, like a grain within the bamboo leaf as well, and it's best to move the baron in the same direction as that grain. In some cases, I'll actually print the same plate twice to get a flat color. Now he's going to do ichimon bokashi, which is another effect. This is really quite cool. We'll go through these later. Um, but one thing I think is really cool, uh, Fred. Um, in Japan, I don't know if you've got like huge ones of those. Yeah. Like, but I'm, ten times bigger. I'm wondering though if those ones were made that way. You know, like I've got, I've got a print of the, yeah. the Great Wave, but uh, mine just came up with Xerox. Like on the photocopy. Um, I didn't have it put it together. But the, if you go to again, if you go to the NGV, um, and I really, really wish we could have gone. Like I really want us to go there, and you can actually see that. Then we have, we have it. The, we have the Great Way in Melbourne. Okay, it's in the gallery. Um, well, no, the original one's a few hundred years old, but it's print. Okay, which means there's not many of these. Okay, I, I think there might be four or five. I guess you could call them original prints of this this artwork, and we've got one. So it's really, really cool. If you have a chance to go there and check it out and see it, I strongly suggest it. Um, anyway, so there's that, all right? Now, as we move on, what I've got here, I'm not going to go through this one per se, but here are a bunch of woodblock prints. These are a bunch of prints. And what these are actually showing, if I go into the gallery, these are showing, remember I talked about last time we chatted about the westernization of Japan? Okay, Japan was a very closed off country, uh, and at one point it, it, it was almost literally closed off from all outsiders. We'll look at that in a second. Um, but when Westerners started to come on board, okay, they used to, it kind of changed a little bit of Japan and, and its society and friend. Have you seen The Last Samurai? Yeah, but I don't think Tom oh, Cruise is. Sort of, no, uh, <laughs> it's sort of. Yeah, like it does talk about that. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. Turning so yeah, and then Tom Cruise comes to Japan too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but so what this is showing, again, I'm not going through it, what this is showing is a series of woodblock prints which show this westernization of Japan. And it, I've talked about it in the uh, descriptions down there. It talks about how these things started to change. You know, their buildings started to change. This isn't a traditional Japanese building. Aww. Okay? Um, they didn't use horse and carriages. Like, you know, these things started to change when people started to get in there, uh, Europeans and Westerners, and Japan started to adopt that kind of style, all right? And it, it really <laughs> kind of changed the country. But these are all woodblock prints. So these are all made in that traditional style. Like, even the dress here, you can see this kind of military dress, very different to what they used to do. Okay, so big changes. So check that one out. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, all right. So that's one art stop. Another one I've got here is probably one that you guys know more about, I'm guessing. If I said what's origami, would you say, oh, it's Japanese? What would you say? Japanese folding paper. Folding, folding paper. Okay. Now the thing is, yes, it's very Japanese, but it didn't actually originate in Japan. Okay. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be looking at, we're talking about Japan, but a lot of the stuff didn't originate there. Okay. A lot of this stuff came from China, because China obviously is quite close to Japan. So a lot of these artworks and these kind of art styles, they came from China first, you know, and over the course of hundreds of years, okay, they came across into Japan, and Japan had it as part of their culture as well, and they put their own take on it. So even though origami is it's a Japanese word, and it means, basically it means folding paper, okay, but it did kind of come from China, and a lot of these artworks do, okay, 
Okay, a lot of these are China is really, really big. Asia is, is really, really big in a lot of the stuff that we look at. Okay, Asia and Europe, these two huge places, which kind of influence a lot of the world. So origami, again, I'm not going to go through origami here. There's quite a lot of information there, but it talks about origami and what it means. Okay, um, it talks about the history and it talks about what it's about. And here you can see, you know. Around that same time, there was this kind of art movement going on in China, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain. They were all doing this paper fold. Okay, uh, and there's obviously the paper crane, I guess, was the most famous um, one. Uh, did anyone here fold one? Oh, I mean, I did you fold one? But did you fold one right now? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right, hold on from there. So, Luke was saying. Luke was saying in primary school they made them fold a thousand. Do you know the meaning behind that? Yes. Job it is. Ba bam! Look at that, page nine. So, what I've got here is actually a pretty, it's a sad, it's actually a very sad story. Um, so, yes, this is when we talk about paper cranes, we talk about origami. A lot of people talk about this story, okay? Um, and uh, I, I probably can't do it justice by summing it up, but essentially uh, there was a thing called World War II. And human beings thought it would be a good idea to drop a bomb, uh, and a couple of bombs, not just the one, um, on Japan, and basically just take out a big chunk. Okay, it ended the war, yes, but it also killed a lot, a lot, a lot of people. All right, or oh, two hundred thousand. Okay, it was not the smartest move in the world, but we're people and we're not that bright. So, what happened though is this story is about this girl. Okay, and she lived about two miles away when this bomb dropped. Okay, she wasn't in the direct vicinity of it, but as you know, bombs, uh, especially nuclear bombs, um, aren't really the best things in the world, and she got really, really sick, as did hundreds of thousands of Japanese kids. Okay, they got really, really sick. And she went into the, into the hospital, and again, I'll get you to read this, because I think it's a really nice story, and I think you should read it yourself. Um, she went into the hospital, and she was getting sick, and someone told her that, you know what, um, there's, this, there's this story, there's this traditional story, it's a story that's been around for a long, long time in Japan, um, and that's it there. Uh, I think, again, my pronunciation, I grab it, Senbazuru, Senbazuru, fam, I'm looking at you for some help. This is where we need Lucky, oh, uh, not Lucky, this is where we need um, your sister to be Skyping in the... Crystal also sent me a CD about Hiroshima. Oh, really? Cool, well, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. So this story, okay, this story, is, it's a legend, that if someone folds 1,000 paper cranes, they get a wish, essentially. Okay, this is the story, this is a good kid's story. And they get a wish, and there it is there, um, if they fold a 1,000 paper cranes. So she wanted to do that. You know, she wanted to fold 1,000 paper She wanted to get a wish, she wanted to be sick anymore. So she started folding these in hospital. Okay, um, and unfortunately she didn't actually finish the 1,000 paper cranes. She died before she could. Um, but all of her schoolmates started to do it. Okay, they started to finish off, even though she passed away, they started to fold them as well. And they were folding them. And it, it, became this, it became this huge story of peace, all right? It's actually a really, really nice story about that. Um, about folding paper cranes and about, you know, about peace. And that's why that, that you know, that, that symbol now, all right, that crane is kind of like a symbol of peace, okay, because of these stories. So, bit of a sidetrack there, but I think it's something that you should check out and read that. Um, but anyway, origami. Uh, is there, and I've got a couple of examples. If you click here, you can actually see how to make a few examples here. So that's origami. There's another art form called kirigami. Uh, does anyone have a stab at the difference? You want to um, cut the glue? Yes. Okay. So very similar. You're folding paper, okay, but with this one, you're allowed to use scissors and glue. Okay, so you can do quite a lot more with it. Uh, and these are, these are basically like a pop up model. But that is all cut from one piece of paper. That'd be uh, I'll say that'd be fairly large. So that's one piece of paper, and they've made all the cuts. What, just a A4 piece of paper? Oh, I'd say they would be an A4. So it's a flat piece of paper, they've made all those cuts, and then they've folded it, and that's what pops out. Pretty impressive stuff. Alright, so there's another art form there as well. Alright, let's move on. Because I've got a couple more, and then I want to actually talk about the project. So, here's another art form here called Sumi, and this is another one where Again, if you look at these kind of images here, you, you look at them, you're like, they're very, you know, they're very traditionally Japanese, you'll see this in Japan. But again, this, this art form comes from Asia. This is kind of uh, studied in Asia as well. All right, now this one here is what they've done here. They're creating artworks with these just strokes of the black ink. Okay, that's how they're making their art. They're doing these quick strokes and they're putting it together and they're making these really, really detailed pieces. Okay, so it's basically black ink um, 
And like I said, it kind of comes from China as well. All right. So a lot of cultures use this kind of art form. Obviously, the Chinese do, Japanese do, all right, Korea, Vietnamese, they all do this kind of style of art as well. So basically, what it means is Sumi means black ink, and the E stands for path or, or road. All right. So it's like a freestyle art of ink painting. It's kind of like, you know, like graffiti, but with, with a brush and with a lot more skills, maybe, uh, and, and, and kind of direction. All right. Um, so have a read through that. It's very zen. It's this. It's very. It's meant to be a very relaxing kind of art. You know, you sit there and you do your strokes, and you're like, "Oh, zen now." Okay, you're all chill. That's the whole point of it. All right. So that is a really, really cool art style, which you guys can check out a little bit further. All right. So let's keep going. Let's go to my next chapter. All right. What I've got here. Uh, you can try this now on your iPads if you want to. If you've got the book ready to go. If you want to give that a click. Uh, it'll bring this up on your iPad and you'll be able to actually have a quick play uh, directly on your iPad screen and paint with these. If anyone wants to switch out, I can see test time and go, have a go. Um, again, it's just, a, it's just kind of a fun uh, example of, I'll see if I can kick mine in. Um, here we go, here. Oh, I guess I'll just hide this so you can see a bit more. All right, let's, uh, let's just start. So this, and then cool, this works on your iPad, so it's really cool. Um, I don't want a template. I'm gonna start that. All right, and then I can. You can actually look checks out. We can do the water. Can't really see that. So you can see how the brushes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'll pick that, and I'll start. It's gonna be hard for me to do on the mouse. I might run in front of you. All right. Wait, wait, no. Camera's gonna see my bum. Let me just go down. All right. So we can go in here, and you can paint. And if you get that, you can see how you can put some more ink on your brush there. Right, Daniel Dunster, you're in. Uh, okay. Um, hold on, let me. So you can kind of do all these kind of cool little, and you can clean the brush and make it a bit softer. All right. How do you get normal back? There we go. Up here. Wash. Anyway, so that's just something to kind of play with. Um, we'll head back to the book. There you go. So that's something to check out uh, on your iPads. That'll work as well. So let's move back. So I'm going to go back into this here. So here are, uh, what I've got here is a bunch of different styles that they use. Now if I just enlarge that, these all mean things. So you'll see this better on your iPad. So all these brush strokes, okay, all these different techniques that they use, they're actually meaning things. Alright, so this kind of brush style, or this kind of brush style, if you have a read of those, they actually mean certain things. Okay, if you do this kind of kind of brush stroke, you're talking about this, or you're inferring this. Okay, so that's something I want you to check out. A lot of information there, and you can see how it's used in rocks and in trees, alright, in kind of strokes, in people's clothing. You can see where they use these strokes, it's really, really cool stuff. And then of course we've got some colour there as well. Alright, so check that out. And that is kind of how you do it. That's the pen that you use as well. All right, let's get out of this. Should I have to put a tomato? Uh, no, the tomato is it's to show you how to hold the brush. You don't actually, it's not part of using it. All right, couple more, and then we're nearly done. So that's another art style. Now finally, this one, so I've gone from traditional art styles. Now I'm jumping on into Kabuki. All right, now this is... What's Kabuki? You didn't write it in English. Oh, it, because it's in the video. Um, now you've seen this, I'm not going to show you this video again. Many elements of traditional Japanese culture, such as cuisine and martial arts, are well known throughout the world. Kabuki, a form of classical theater performance. You've got this, guys. You've got this in your book. You can watch it later. Because again, not all of these art forms are going to interest everybody. Okay, that's why I put it there. So Kabuki is for those of you that like it. Okay, but it's different. It's a very it's a very traditional kind of dance, okay? And I don't think I've seen anyone perform it as in other than the Japanese. I don't think, like, we don't have a version of it, I guess. There's no culture block, kind of, you know what I mean. Um, and here's some kabuki actors. Now, here's a trick. Um, what, are we, what are we seeing here? Do you think? What are we seeing? What? Um, two guys in white faces. Yeah, Fred knows. Now we're seeing two guys. Okay. Now, I've, did you guess that, Fred, or did you know that? 
Uh, okay, um, so what you'll find out, okay, Kabuki traditionally now is all performed by men. Okay, the men do all the roles, they do the women uh, in their shows. Okay, that wasn't always the case. And if you haven't read through here, if you haven't read through here, it talks about that. Alright, it talks about the fact that they kind of changed. Alright, and in fact, here it is here. So in 1629, they actually prohibited women, it was a law, that they could perform in this play. I mean, could you imagine if they did that here? Could you imagine if they said, you know what, from now on ballet, it's one late one blokes. Um, wouldn't be as great time. But it became, it became very unique, and that's what this style of dance is known for. The guys, you know, being the women, and they dress up. And if you watch this video here, you can see them putting on the makeup. It's really, it's and the way they move and the way they act. Okay, I'm going to It's very low. It's very low. Kabuki is a Japanese traditional theatre form which originated in the Edo period. Yeah, exactly. Um, again, you can watch this later, but it's, yes, it's very. It's a very. It's, you need to watch it, okay? I, can't, I don't think I can do justice trying to explain. I saw a lot of these shows uh, when, I was, when I was living there, and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very unique way of, of theatre, okay? So definitely watch that video if it's interesting. you. Okay, the guys, I'm hoping some of the guys looking at this going, yeah, I can probably dump that out for my project. Um, I want to do that. A lot of white makeup. All right, so please have a read through this again. All right, let's move on. I want to make sure I finish all of this, guys, before we even go anywhere. So we need to kind of like stop. All right. So here's another art form. Now I'm jumping forward a bit now, so I'm going into manga. Okay. So a lot of you guys know, and by guys, obviously everyone here kind of knows manga as, as an art form. What, when I say manga, what do you think of? Ca cartoons, but maybe comics. Comics, Pokemon. Yes. So guys, manga is. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a term um, that basically ret refers to comics and kind of cartooning. Okay, that's what it's for. Manga as a term used outside Japan refers to comics generally. So, you know, if someone says manga, people go, oh yeah, comics in Japan. Okay, uh, it's a very kind of Japanese style, but again, you know, it's just kind of gone all over the place as well. The difference, I guess, I think between manga and Japan, uh, especially if you've never been there before, it's kind of interesting. This is, manga is, how can I put it? All right. If, if you saw, if you went past Mr. Deer's office and you saw him sitting back reading a comic book, you would probably go, whoa, that's right. You, would you maybe not take him that seriously? Because he's chilling reading a comic book? Okay, yeah, you would. Okay, but in Japan, manga is, it's not like that. It's not like a kiddie thing, okay? It's not for, it's not for kids, I mean, it's not just for children, okay? Man, everyone reads manga in Japan. All right, we've got, because we've got adults, we've got businessmen, you know, we've got little kids, they all read it. It's like everyone in Australia, you know, reads books. It's, 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 it's the same thing. Um, the difference is, manga covers a huge range of topics, okay? It, it covers, you know, Astro Boy and Pokemon and stuff like that, but it also covers, you know, historical drama and science fiction and comedy and really serious stuff. They use it for everything, okay? So it's a lot of people, um, this is this is just like you would go to a library and you would buy a book or you would borrow a book. You would do the same with a manga as well. So they have, so they don't have books. Of course they do. All right. So that's manga. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time. What I want you to do, if this interests you, okay? Um, manga is like most Japanese, uh, pretty much all Japanese books and stuff, is read and written and drawn and displayed in a certain way, okay? So what I've got here, this little keynote, this interactive keynote, is a manga talking about the history of manga. Okay, that's where I'm going. So I've, you, I'm basically going from this, you, you read here, and then you go here, and then you go back. So their books are the opposite to us. Okay, and I would personally say that makes more sense. Because I'm an attendant, so I like that I can open that way and read it. It's Pikachu. Read the comic later and find out. Okay, so we'll get out of that. So that's a manga on manga, okay? And 
Let's move across. All right, I'm going to speed through this now because we're, we've got oh, we've got a bit of time. So here's chapter three. Now this chapter here, guys, is really important. So we've talked about artworks. All right. Now one thing hopefully that you've got from these artworks is awesome. Battery's flat. Why don't we even bother with equipment at this school? Um, what we've got here is these Japanese art forms that I've showed you. Okay, I think they're there to tell stories, essentially. Okay, all these art pieces, manga. Okay, there's woodblock prints, uh, that theatre. They're all telling stories. All right, which is really important. So in this chapter here, what I've got is I've got kind of a little bit of a breakdown. So I've got all right. What you've seen in the last chapter selection uh, of Japanese art forms is that the artworks have been used in many ways to tell stories. Okay, so these are traditional stories, all right, these could be new stories, you know, they can talk stories about the past, or they might talk stories about their future, okay, like how we write a, a book. Okay, the, these artworks have been used to tell a story. So in this chapter, what I've got here is some selected artworks, and then I've talked about what they're actually talking about, what their story is. So, if you have a look at this piece of art here, I'll just enlarge this one. So again, you'll do this in your own time. We have a look at this artwork, there's a lot going on here. Okay? And here's some more detailed uh, views of it. We can see we've got some horsemen here, we've got some women over here, so what's going on? Alright, wow, they're falling into pits apparently! And then these people are coming on boats. So that is all... Yes, that's exactly what they are. Good work. All right, so these are change. These are kind of change room doors, essentially. Um, screens. Sorry. Screens. Thank you. All right, so let's get out of this one. So that big painting there, okay? That big painting there is the. It's basically the, the battle of Ichinotani and Yashima. All right. And so what this here, what this uh, detail has here, is this talks about that painting. What you see, okay? What is getting shown there? What is, what is it about? How is that meaning this? How is that meaning that? Okay, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So it's saying, here's a picture, and with this, this, with, this, uh, with this image, they are trying to talk about this. They're trying to show you that. They're trying to explain what happened, all right? And this breakdown tells you all of that. So it's really, really important. So have a read through that. And I'm sure you're still going, why are we doing all this? And I'll talk about that soon. Yeah, why we're all going. Here we go. So let's move across. When I'm in this in this section here, I've got these here. Now, this is another interactive one which you can do in your iPad, which shows you a whole bunch of fans. Alright? And what are these fans about? What are these fans about? Have a look in there. If you go into this section here, okay, you'll be able to look at each of these fans, see the image on it, and then actually see what the story is about. So I'll show you a really quick example. So it talks about um, this artwork. All right, so let's go into fan number nine. All right, there's a number two one. There we go, number nine. All right, and what you'll see is you'll see the image eventually. There we go. Here's an image. So who wants to have a guess? What's going on there with these three guys on a tree? Someone, someone interpret what they see. All right, well, anyone else? You're a bird in the tree and you kill it. Anyone? All right, so we've got dancing, we've got looking, we've got birds. So let's see what, let's see what, actually, let's see looking. Let's see what the story is in this fan. Let's have a apple. look. There's an apple. Three brothers' parents told them always to stay together. After the parents died, the brothers quarreled and divided the property, including a tree in their yard. The tree started to die. Startled by the sight, the brothers agreed never again to divide their inheritance Honouring their parents' wish to stick together, whereupon the, th the tree came back to life. <laughs> yeah, Jackie gets a point for that. So, that, ladies and gentlemen, so that is the story behind that fan. Okay? So, here's an image. You all came up with your own interpretation of what the story was, but that was what they were trying to do. Let's do another one. Alright, we'll do one. No, we won't. Yeah. No, no, I want to get back. You've got this in your book, you can do it anytime. Okay. Finally! Alright, we're there. So, here is your project. Alright, this is the final home stretch. Can you please sit in the chair? Can you please sit in the chair? Alright, so, what have I done, guys? I have talked about Japan, I have talked about Japanese history, I have talked about artworks, and I've shown you some artworks. 
I've talked about how you interpret a story from an artwork, okay, and I've talked about how you can explain that. All right, here's your project. What you're going to be doing, all right, is you are going to tell a story. So, three parts. Basically, your project will use many of the historical skills we've learned about, which are here. We will learn these as we go. So here it is here. Your project will be made up of three sections. Part one is you're going to study a Japanese art style. And you're going to choose it. Any art style you like, okay? As long as it's the traditional Japanese art style, you're going to study it. I'll explain what you do in a second. So you might pick some of the few that I showed you. You might find one that you want to do, because there are lots of them. Okay, you might choose one that is exactly what you like. You really like, you want to find more about it. You know, that more info about it, you're choosing that one. Okay, that's part one. Part two is you are going to choose a historical event that happened in Japan. Okay, this could be a battle, this could be um, a, a leader, this could be some kind of story. It has to be a historical a story that happened in Japan, and it needs to be between, you've got a fairly big range here, all right, 794 and 1867. That's a fair, you've got a thousand years to play with. A few things happen, trust me. A few. Okay, that's part two. Part three is going to be, I think, possibly the, the, the fun part, but it could be tricky too. You are going to create a piece of artwork. And that's your third part of this project. Okay? So, let me explain these three parts in a bit more detail. Alright, so, part one. So, part one, we have just explored like a very, very small sample. I think I showed you, what, four or five? Really, really small. And the ones I showed you are probably the popular ones that everyone knows about, which is why I showed you. Okay? But, there are lots more. I mean, there's sculpture, there's dance, music. Obviously, architecture, so the building design. Um, we've got a whole bunch of anime. I didn't talk about anime at all. Um, video games, obviously, there's stacks in there. So, in part one, you're going to choose an art style from Japan. And if you have any questions at all, make sure you see me first. Like, if you're thinking, Luke, please pay attention. If you're a little bit unsure, if you feel this, this, art, this art style is a, a, tr a traditional kind of Japanese art style, please see me first. I don't want to spend a lot of time and you end up going, oh, I don't know, it, it was not the right choice. Okay, so make sure you see if you have any questions, but I think you'll get this. What you need to do is choose one that interests you the most, I think it's probably the most important. You know, I'm very, I'm all for you guys doing what you like, okay? So choose an art style that interests you. Now, here's the trick. Make sure you choose one which you feel you might be actually be comfortable in making yourself. Okay, and you'll find out why in a second. So if you go, oh, I want to do uh, traditional Japanese uh, dance, because that just interests me. Make sure you're willing to do a traditional Japanese dance. Okay? So you've got to think about that. All right? That's what you're going to do. And what you're going to do, once you've chosen your art style, you're going to research some things on it. So part one is a research paper. Okay? You're going to give me an introduction to this artwork. What's it called? All right, give me its Japanese uh, spelling, its name, and also the English translation. Okay, what it usually depicts, what's this art form based, can I finish? What's this art form basically used for, what does it show? Okay, you need to talk about that. I want you to talk about the history of it, including the period of time. So that's that Edo period, you know, those kind of those long periods that we talk about. All right, and how it became popular. Why is this a popular art song? You need to talk about that. I want you to talk about how the artwork was created. How do they make this artwork? With the woodblock prints, for instance, that's an easy one. We just talk about how they make it. I want you to talk about important artists, Jordan. Important artists that use this style. Okay, so again, guys, I've only explained this whole project once, Jordan, so no excuses, all right? Important artists, so some famous artists that use this particular style. Okay. And then I want you to show me a range of examples of this artwork, okay? And you need to label them and make annotations of the artwork, okay? You can't just give me an image. You need to give me the image, talk about the image itself, who made it, when, what style, what date, okay? And also some of your annotations. So it's really important that you do that. That's part one of your project. Now, because I feel that's quite, that's quite specific, all right, but I've actually given you an example. 
okay? Because I feel this is this is really important. I, I don't like when people give you a project and go, here it is, I want this. So I'm giving you an example of what a completed part would look like. Alright? Now bear in mind, this is ridiculously detailed. Okay? So I've obviously sourced this information from various places and put this together. Uh, this is in my original writing here by any means. Um, but I've put together an example of part one. Okay? A very, 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 very detailed example. I'm not expecting everyone to give me one of these in their own words. Okay? But it's, a, it's an example. So what I've got here is I'm talking about UQE, I'm talking about what it's called, it's English word, it's translation, it's history, how it became popular, so all the things here, uh, it was affordable, I've talked about why it became popular, okay, it became popular because it was affordable. I've talked about the history of it, okay, where it began, what periods, Luke, what periods that it began in, okay, and how long it lasted. I talked about the techniques used to make it, alright, then I've talked about how it's made, alright, I've talked about how it's put together, like literally, you then get print, you get prints and you face them and you lose them, and I've talked about how they make it. All right. I've talked about some important artists, All right. and what I've got here is be sure to include examples of their work. So if you're talking about three important artists, give me some examples of their work. Okay. And then finally, I've got popular artworks, and then here's one on the side here. So here's a very popular artwork that uses that style, Okay. and then under that, I've annotated it correctly, here's the artist, here's the year this artwork was probably made, Okay, they don't have an exact date. Here's the type of artwork it is, and here are the dimensions. That's how you kind of annotate an artwork. Okay? You need to say the artist, the year, and the type. The type being what it's made from. It's really important that you do that. So again, I've given you an example so you don't get lost. You go back and check this. And then finally, I've got some information on that artwork. I've talked about what the artwork's called, what it means, what it's showing, who the artist was, and all of those kind of things as well. Okay? And then I'll just put a note here that you can see the end of it. So that's an example of part one. That's what I want to see for part one. Okay? Does that kind of all make sense? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Oh. Yes. And the best part is, if it doesn't make sense, you've got it right in your book. You can see an example of it, you can speak to me, you can see it there. Okay, part one done. Let's move on. Part two. Okay, part two a little bit is going to be a little bit yeah, me. trickier. So, in part two, we're going to be looking at a story. Okay. Now, I've given you a certain amount of time, lads. We're talking about 794 to 1867. And that term is basically Japan under the shoguns. That's what we're looking at in history. Okay, And that's that time frame there. 794 to 1867. Long time. All right, kind of long. 1050 years. So, what I've got here is, there are some really interesting, interesting stories. We're going to cover a few topics when we do Japan history in our actual class time, though. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. But we can't cover it all. It's a thousand years. It'll take you a while. So, what I want you to do is you are going to research any event of your choosing that happened between 794 and 1867. You're going to choose an event that interests you. Okay. Don't choose something that you think, oh, this will be alright, I'll have some information on it. Choose something that interests you, something that you think is really, really cool. Okay. So this is going to basically ask you to do a bit of research. Look on the internet, see what you can find in that time frame. Now I've got, obviously, a quick little timeline here, and I've got quite a few things that you might want to check out. We've got, I mean, it was a pretty crazy time. We've got, we've got murderers, we've got assassinations, we've got wars that go on for a couple of hundred years. You know, we've got battles, we've got samurai, we've got Christianity coming along. A lot went on, okay, a lot went on. We've got Japan, um, a, remember we talked about the, the, the Mongols? All right, those crazy guys. All right, there was a time where the Mongols had, had this huge army, all right, crazy huge army, and they're about to invade Japan. Okay, and they would win. I mean, they were probably going to win. But they had thousands of these men. They got in their ships. They sailed across Japan, and they're like, "All right, we're going to win." This typhoon struck, wiped them all out. Okay, so there was this huge war that was going to happen. They just happened to land on the beach at the wrong time. A typhoon struck and it wiped them out. All right, that's a really cool story because if that typhoon didn't happen, this whole history could change. And here's the funny part, all right? That happened. Okay, and then the Mongols were like, crap, um, we'll give it another go. Alright, so a few years later, 
They do the same thing. They get all these people together, huge ships, all right, armies, giants, they're ready to go. Giants. Um, giant ships. All right, we're going to take Japan. It didn't work the first time. That's right, bad luck. You know, who knew a typhoon? Bad luck. They land on the beach. What happens? Typhoon comes in again. <laughs> all right, wipes them out again. So two times. Land on a different beach. Yeah. It's, it's unlucky. Oh, that is fake. But two times they came in to try and basically take over this country. Because that's what the Mongols did. All right, they were biggest guys. All right, they took over. They, just, they would go into, into country, they would go into, into settlements, and they would wipe them out. They would just completely get rid of them. Alright? Genghis Khan, they reckon this guy killed like millions and millions and millions of people. Alright? Anyway, so there's really cool stories like that. Really interesting stories. There's a story that talks about, you know, these warriors that come in. There's this woman warrior who's crazy, you know, this really, really, really cool story. So you're going to research a story. You're going to pick one. Alright, find a story that you like. And you're going to research it. So, this is what you're going to do with that story in part two. You need to cover the date. So, when did this event happen? Alright? And, you know, where, how long did it go for? Some simple stuff there. Alright? What were the factors that led up to it? That's an easy one, yeah? What happened? What, what happened before to make this event happen? Why did the Mongols want to invade? Or, why did this samurai assassinate this guy, you know? Those kind of things. What actually happened, it's probably important, you know, what, what happened in this event, what went on? Who were the key people involved? You know, who were the main people that were involved in this event that you're going to be talking about? Uh, one of my favourite, what were the short-term and long-term effects? Okay, you know short-term and long-term. What were the effects of this particular event you're researching? And then finally, I've got, provide some annotated samples, so we're bringing that back again. Okay, let's, we, you can do the origami anytime there, Brock. Um, Find some annotated samples of primary and secondary sources of this event. Alright, switch across. Here's an example of part two. Done the same thing for you. I've given you a detailed example of what part two is about. So what I've used is I've used this really, this, it's a pretty cool event that happened, okay? And it's called, I see if I can get it right, I'm really bad at my presentation. Sakuku or Sakoku, alright? Basically what it means, it means change country. Now what happened, alright, is it was a policy of Japan. So the government came up with this policy. Alright, and this is the policy that they came up with. Basically, no uh, foreigner could enter Japan, and no Japanese person could leave Japan. It was war. Couldn't leave. No one could come into the country, no one could leave the country. That was a law. Okay? That's like if we put this law on right now. Once you guys are here, you cannot leave the school. No one can come into the school, you guys can't, can't go out of it. It was a law. Okay? And it was illegal to do so up until 1868. It went on for a long time. So from 18, um, basically we've got this policy. The policy was enacted by the Tonka Guana Shugati. I don't know how to these words. All right, and it was in effect until 1853. All right, so it went for a long time. And that's when, after 1853, people were allowed to come into Japan. Okay, but it was still illegal to leave until 1868. All right. Now, that's the story. That's the event. I'll talk about the subject, but I'm not sure I'm done with this. All right. That's the story that I'm talking about. All right. So here's my example. I've talked about the story really quickly. Um, I've then talked about the reasons why, and there were three reasons: fear of foreign conquest, fear of domestic unrest, and the fear uh, arising out of anti-Christian movements growing since the late 16th century. Basically, Japan were a little bit scared. Okay. They're a small little country. They're small. Um, and they were uh, afraid of foreign conquest. You know, the Mongols came in twice, the typhoons, they probably be screwed. You know, they didn't want people coming into their country changing their way of life. So, war happens, alright? So that's the reasons why. Um, basically, it was this fear, and I've talked about why. I've talked about the Spaniards, that's crazy, guys. Uh, I've talked about the Dutch, alright, and I've talked about what happened, alright? Here are the short term and long term effects. I've talked about the short term and long term effects of this event. Um, it was actually really good for a while. It brought stability to Japan for the next two and a half centuries. All right. So this law was enacted for a long time. All right. For a long time, you couldn't leave Japan, you know, and no one would come in. So Japan was really nice. Everyone was friends. Everyone got along, you know, because they were we were all Japanese, um, and everyone was really cool. All right. So that was one of the long-term effects: uh, economic and social prosperity. Long-term effect as well. Japan actually had this really long kind of period of time where 
economically, they were rich, they were wealthy, they were a wealthy country, they got along really, really well, they didn't worry about imports, exports, any of that kind of stuff. Everything was in the one country. And they they they, they really um, yeah, they really strived and they really it was really prosperous times. So that was a good thing. Alright. Short term, long term effect. The end of Japanese overseas expansion. Okay, probably could be a bad one. So obviously if you couldn't leave Japan, uh, Japan's not getting any bigger. Alright, if no one could leave, all Japan had to its name was that the Little Island. Okay, could you imagine if England had this law? No one could leave England. Alright? They wouldn't have found Australia. We wouldn't be Australian, we might be German, or we might be Dutch, or we might be Dutch. Okay? So they didn't really expand. Alright? And this is the funny one too. Another long-term event of this. Another long-term event, ladies and gentlemen, of this policy is the widening of the technological gaps between Japan and the West. So Japan didn't allow anybody into their country. That means they didn't allow scientists. They didn't allow um, religions, other religions in their own. They didn't allow anyone into their country. So in England, in Europe, they were inventing stuff. You know, they were coming up with printing presses and medicine and airplanes and no. Uh, and gun, well, that, you know, weapons. They were coming up with all of this stuff. Japan didn't know anything about it. No, no, no. Okay. So they had this big gap. This big gap. Play. This big gap between Japan and everybody else. Okay. It's like if they shut the doors again at Braemar, we didn't leave, we would have no idea what's going on. I mean, let's face it, there's not much going on at Wood End, but, you know, we wouldn't know what's going on in the rest of the world. So that's a short term and long term effect. Alright. And then finally, guys, I've got some primary and secondary sources. Fred? So here's a primary source. All right, this is one of the towers that they used to sit and make sure they could see everyone coming in so no one was coming to their country. All right, I've got an image, a woodblock print of one of the final ships, so that'd be a primary. I've got a newspaper article, and then I've got an image of this fleet arriving in Japan. This is where they ended this chain of country. This, this, these English guys came in, and you'll discover the story later. Okay, All right, so that's uh, <laughs> secondary source. So that's an example of part two. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Pretty easy so far? Yeah. Okay, again, choose a story that interests you. You'll do a far better job if you choose. This, I think this is interesting. I really love this policy. This, I mean, it's a bit kind of crazy, but it's like saying, you know what? We're done. No one's coming in. No one's going out. We're happy with that. I mean, imagine trying to do that now. So I think this is a really, really, really interesting story, so I like it. But choose a story that interests you. That's super important. Okay? All right. Finally, nearly there. You can see Grace is just starting about. All right, we're nearly there. Part three. So this is this is the part where you get to be creative. All right, Jordan, nearly there. This is the part where you get to be creative. All right. So what you're going to do in part three is you're going to combine the knowledge you gain from scrapbooking. So you're going to combine the knowledge you gain from part one. Okay. So the research you've done in part one. And the research you've done in part two. So you've researched an artwork that you like. Uh, sorry, an art style you like. You've researched a story that you like. Okay? And we also talked about how you tell a story. So in part three, you are going to create an artwork. Good. You're going to create an artwork. You're going to create, basically, an artwork which will tell the story that you research. So let me explain that one again. You've researched a certain art style and you've researched a story. So part three, you're going to use that art style to create an art piece in that style that tells the story that you researched in part two. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so here's an example. I've given you some examples. So if you did woodblock prints, you could get your art style that you like. You would create a series of these prints. Now, so I'm not expecting you to, yeah, you can if you want to, but I'm not expecting you to go and make the original woodblock prints. Okay, that would be awesome though. But I want you to create a series of prints that are in that style that might show how the Mongols tried to invade Japan. Okay, so you've got a series of images in that traditional woodblock print style play that talks about how the Mongols tried to invade Japan. So you're visually showing that. Okay, that would be an example, that would be something you could do for part three. Alright? Or you could do 
a manga. You could create one if you wanted to. Several pages of a manga that explained what happened during the Onan War. Okay, you were going to make a comic that actually talks about this war and what and, and what happened. All right, you're going to display that. Clay, I need your attention, brother. Yeah. Oh, you might do you might do a dance piece. You might choreograph a whole dance piece or a, a bit of musical theatre. All right, that tells. No, I'm going to go, please. That tells the story of this lady called Tommy Gozen, and she was this female warrior, like crazy fierce female warrior. You might do a dance or a piece of theatre that talks about that. Okay? So does Ash... The, the, the art piece part three, does that have to be... Sorry, Ash, I'm not talking, so I'll wait till they're finished. Does that uh, piece of art have to be... Sorry, Ash, still going. Does that piece of art have to be the whole event, or just a maybe a certain part? Or? It's your choice, as long as you are telling a story. Okay? So I should be able to look at your art piece and go, oh, cool, this is obviously the art piece, the art style they... Uh, study in part one. I'll see that in your art piece, and I'll be able to look at it and be able to tell the story that you researched in part two. Okay, it's a real visual way of putting those two parts together. All right, that's part two. Uh, part three, sorry. And finally, you will also need to do a document. Okay, you know when you go to uh, the the gallery and you hit this piece of art, very famous piece of artwork. Okay, they generally have like a little booklet. And the booklet will say, this is the artwork, this is what the artist did, this is when he made it, this is how he made it, and it talks about stuff like that. You're making one of those as well for your art piece. Okay? It's a supporting document that will actually tell you, or tell me, who, who, the, the gallery you the attending, um, what your artwork is about, who made it, which is going to be you, obviously, um, why you made it, how you made it, we're going to talk about that. Okay? So you're explaining your own piece of work. That's what you need to do. So really, really important. Now this is this is the tricky one. This is what I want to make sure you understand this one. Okay? Is you need to be representing your art piece accurately. Okay? So for instance, if you're doing woodblock prints, again, I don't expect you to make fresh things on it. I don't expect you to make the woodblock, but again, if you do, freaking awesome. Uh, but you would if you were gonna draw one for me, it would need to be in that same style. So you would be using the same kind of colours and the same kind of lines, and that kind of stuff, which you would research in part two, okay? You would know that. If you were doing a dance, or you were doing, you were doing kabuki, your dance should be in the same style as the way they do their dance. You won't be doing pop and lock, all right? You would be doing their very, it's a very distinctive style. Ladies, let me finish, please. Um, you need to make sure you're doing that. Okay, you need to be sticking with the style. Now this is where, again, you need to speak with me if you are a little bit lost, okay? Because this can be tricky, all right? If you're a little bit unsure, if you're not, you know, like 100% on, is this the correct way, is it, just see me. You know, I will, I, I'm a nice guy. Okay, anytime, email me whenever you need, and I will, I'll help you out, and I'll guide you later. Right, this is really important to understand this, mate. You want to give me a mark on this? Okay. Um, See me, see me for any advice you want on this, okay? It's clarification on your art style, if you're doing it the right way, okay? Because I want to make sure that you do this really, really well, because I think it'll be awesome if you do it perfectly. And I think you'll do a great job, okay? Now, does anyone have any questions on that? Yes. No. Well, so what I'm saying here is in part one, okay, you've researched art style. Okay. In part two, you've researched the story. And to you have to. Yeah, you have to find part one, part two, part three. No, no, you're all three. Part three doesn't test the one. Right, guys. Don't take a seat. Guys, I'm going to be explaining this once. Okay. So part one, you research an art style. And you understand it. You can't create an art style if you don't understand it. Okay? You can't tell a story if you don't know the story. Okay? So part one, you research an art style. Part two, you research the story. And part three, your art piece, is the visual representation of that story. So part one plus part two. Essentially. And you do part one, part two, part three. Okay? To demo. Alright. So. Any other questions? 
I've given you examples, okay? We'll talk about the success criteria next class, and that's quite detailed as well, all right? But you should be right to go, okay? Is everyone getting it? Yes! Are we excited? Yes! Question! 